Frank's Red Hot is the perfect blend of flavor and heat. So you can use an entire bottle to make recipes like buffalo chicken dip or buffalo nachos. Or even things that don't start with buffalo. Frank's Red Hot. I put that shit on everything. Hey, Craig. Hey Jeff, 45 minutes later than I anticipated saying that. I fucking love technology. Yeah. It's so great. Yeah. Fuck technology. It's terrible. Best I plan is to start. We're going to start it early. Today. Yeah. We're get done early. You're not going to be mixing yeah. at midnight. You know, it's going to be great. 8.30, what do you think? Yeah, I can do 8.30, no problem. I get my kids to bed. We can do it at 8.30. Well, you know, that's how it goes. It's now... Computer nine screen. fifteen while we're starting. So, so yeah, just a little inside baseball. <laughs> um, and your your beer is is no longer cold. My beer is no longer cold. Um, <sighs> it's not. It wasn't even that warm to begin with because you know, I like I drove to Peaks and Pints and I got it and then and then uh, I don't know. Like I guess in just like the two minute drive home between fridge to fridge, uh, maybe while I was looking for other beer. Like it, it got a little bit warmer, and so it didn't get yep. cool, like cool down in the fridge. So yeah, it's just we're we're having a great time over here, over here at at uh, HQ West. <laughs> and this is podcast versus everyone, episode one sixty one. I'm Craig Powers. With me, as always, is Jeff Newser. And Jeff, That's you know, me. if <laughs> if 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 I was still singing the the intro song, I'd be. Would it be the two out of three a bad or, or the yeah, fuck it yeah. goes? Um, it would be it would definitely be something like that and the hilarious part is like two out of three felt like something not as good as two out of three like no. because of that loss to washington was so shitty but yep it, it's it's funny like since we recorded last it, we're, they've gone two and three yeah. and two and you one know, that ain't bad yeah. that's not or two and one right they've won two out of three that that shouldn't be bad but I don't you know when i was at that way you know i i, I went up uh uh, three out of four days driving up to Seattle for sporting events. Went on Saturday to that game. You know, once again, made the mistake of going somewhere in Seattle to eat before. And once again, they were in, like incredibly slow. So we missed part of the start of the game. Like, I, I just, uh, I will never learn. But, hey, we went to the, the Hard Liver Barley Wine Festival at Brower's Cafe. And I had some... Uh, steak frites and I, you know i can't complain about that i did have one of the worst beers i've ever had in my life we can talk about that in the beer <laughs> section but you know yeah then we went Bra- to the by U-Dub the way browers and- browers is going to come up again in the beer section so yeah talk about that yeah too. i saw your saw your little beer um but uh but yeah so so that sucked that makes it that makes it worse you know when, when you see yeah. someone in person but but you know it started out on was that Wednesday? Was that last Wednesday when yeah. I played UW? Yep, um, last Wednesday. Yep, yep. Wasn't the prettiest win over UW, which is kind of the – we're not looking for pretty wins anymore. We don't care what they look like. You know, at the start of the year, when you're playing the you know the, the low majors and stuff, you kind of stress when you don't win by enough or, you know, oh, we didn't look good enough. But now it's just like, I don't care how they fucking win. Can they just win? Yep. After they've lost so many tough games, they were on a five-game losing streak. So yep. just, you know, they, they played some shitty defense against UW. Uh, and, and, but, you know, luckily UW's defense was just not expecting Muhammad Gay to hit <laughs> 10-footers. Yeah. And w- and they decided like, that you know what that, he's going to miss some of those at some point, and then he just never did. 
so. and decided to just let F.A. Abagidi stand under the basket just in case Muhammad Gay missed those two pointers, those 10 foot two pointers. Um, and that was basically WC's entire offense. <laughs> and it worked perfectly 1.20 points. Well, yeah, possession. down the stretch, man. It was, I, I, I'm trying to remember now because it was like almost a week ago at this point, but, um, I, I want to say I think the last field goal by a guard by a non big was like with like almost thirteen minutes left in the game or something, yeah. and I think all every other basket from there on out was uh, was F A or Mo, and then I think Deshaun had one in there as well, and then Flowers hit some free throws at the end, and that that yep. was it for the guards. It was crazy. I, yeah, I'm not 40, sure I've ever seen anything like that. Forty six from F A and Mo, and then. You know, you add eight from Deshaun, so you get fifty-four of your seventy-eight points are are from yeah. your three bigs. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, and and you know, Flowers gets twelve of the rest, and then not really much else from anyone else. But it was, you know, that's what UW was giving. You know, UW really in this first matchup sold out to defend the three, and WSU that's got to be one of the season lows. I haven't looked. Only took seventeen threes out of sixty-one field goal attempts. Um, there was also kind of a heavier whistle in this game than we've seen in recent games in Pac-12 play. Uh, so WC shot quite a few free throws and made quite a few, um, which, you know, wasn't the case the rest of the week. But, um, you know, so they really dominated that game, offensive rebounding, that high low po- high post, low post action. That That's just kind of the staple of any, uh, you know, zone beater offense. And it worked out. And... Uh, but the one kind of alarming part was they gave up 1.08 to, you know, almost 1.1 points per possession to UW in that game. Um, yep. And, and that was kind of, uh, a a harbinger of what was to come in, in terms of defense as they were playing their, uh, what, uh, fifth, fourth, fifth and sixth games in the span of 14 days. They uh they they fell apart <laughs> in Seattle, man. It's I you know there was that the, the game on Wednesday in Pullman. There was a part of me that was like, okay, well the def- the overall defensive numbers don't look good, but they also gave up some you know ridiculously easy buckets early in the game, and it's got okay, it's kind of skewed by you know these you know early easy buckets, blah blah blah, and you know so I I think I'd kind of talked myself into that a little bit, and um. You know, part of it is, you know, with Washington also, you know, you mentioned it wasn't the prettiest game. I mean, that's just the nature of playing Washington. Like nothing, nothing's going to look pretty when you play against them in that zone and and the things they do. Like it just, they're going to muck it up. They're going to slow it down. Um, You know, to beat the zone, the ball's going to go side to side a bunch. Like it just, it's just not going to be attractive when you're playing a, playing a team like that. So, you know, I, I, I wasn't like sort of overall, you know, I, I wasn't all that stressed out about it. And then, uh, and then Saturday happened and I didn't, you know, I didn't get to watch much of the game. I got to watch basically the last eight minutes was all, um, you know, I was kind of following the score in the first half and like, okay, here we go. Yeah, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. And then, um, then I'm kind of watching the score in the second half and it's like, uh, it, it disappeared real, real fast. And, uh, and then I watched the last eight minutes and, and, you know, we just could not, um, just could not keep anybody in front of us. Uh, and I think, you know, I kind of wrote about that on Monday. I, you know, I was trying to figure out what to write and, you know, I was, I was just kind of looking at stuff and, and looking at stats and, and trying to figure some things out. And, I, you know, I just, I just think that we're really tired. Um, and, and, you know, I think some of that, we'll obviously talk about Oregon state as well, but, you know, we allowed uh, Oregon state to score 1.32, points per possession. And, you know, for context, this is a team that was, you know, the Cougars were allowing uh, up until these games against Washington, they were allowing about, I want to say about like 0.92 or 0.91 points per possession Mm -hmm. in conference play. Um, It was something like that. And they were, I think they had just, um, I think they had just dropped to two second overall in the conference or something like that um, behind, I think behind UCLA. And so, you know, but still, you know, like I think they dropped uh, to two after the first U Dub game. I think they were still barely been, hanging been. on the for uh, to that the top spot. So, yeah. either way, 
one of the best defenses in the conference in conference play, no matter how you want to look at it. Um, and then they go and they play Washington twice and they play Oregon state and, and neither of those teams are any good really offensively. And they allowed 1.08, 1.12 and 1.32, um, which is just absolutely absurd. And I, and I think some of it is, you know, I, I was kind of, after the second Washington game, I was like, okay, I think, I think I'm kind of legit concerned about the defense. And then, um, you know, that obviously played out against Oregon as well. I, it, for us, I think the big thing is this, you know, so much of our defense is predicated on effort and being in the right spot and just playing really hard. Um, Cause we don't have out, outside of FA and, and Muhammad gay, we don't have superlative athletes, right? So it's not, it's, it's not like, you know, Arizona that, you know, smothers people or, or UCLA that smothers people. Like it's, um, you know, our good defense is, is kind of a different, a little different brand of good defense. Right. And um, you know, when you've played as many games as we have and, and you know, playing, I think two or three more games over the course of uh, over this time period than they would normally play. I, you know, it's just, you, you really start to see it in that game against Washington, the second half and then against Oregon state, same deal. They just could not stay in front of anybody. And they also gave up a ton of, uh, of free throws and, uh, you know, yep. and, and also they didn't force a lot of turnovers either. So if you kind of put all that together, you go, okay, so what, what are maybe indicators of tiredness? Um, sending another team to the free throw line, not stealing the ball because you're a little slow on reaction. And then um, again, just the eye test of watching guys unable to stay in front of guys. Um, yeah. I, I just think they were really tired. And I think, um, you know, this upcoming weekend coming home, I think is going to be huge. Um, just being at home, you know, they're, <laughs> they're not going to be well rested before the Pac-12 tournament, but you know, whatever, I guess I, I just, you know, this, this schedule is unusual and it's, it's packing a ton of games in and, yeah, you're um, adding still, three. I don't know how you account for that. So you're adding three games in these three weeks that weren't supposed to be there, right? Um, you know, with with adding the Oregon game, adding adding the UW game, and adding the Oregon State game, those yep. were all supposed to happen earlier in the year. the The UW yep. week was supposed to be a, a bit of a break. You know, you have yep. one game on Sunday. You you have a whole full week off after traveling to LA. And no, instead you're playing UW in the middle. And obviously UW had to deal with that too, you know, so it's not like the only excuse. Um, but, you know, in these games against UW, it, it's kind of wild. You know, we thought just let Terrell Brown get his is what we thought. In the first game, they didn't. And UW still played pretty good offense. And he didn't have, he wasn't much of a yep. factor. The second game, he was a huge factor, but also he was kind of the worst part of their offense. Like he, he took. He got 25 points, but he took 21 shots and 12 free throws to get there. So he's basically an yep. you know, and, and only one assist. He wasn't like setting everyone up. He was bending the defense a little bit, and he did force WSU, I think, into using more zone, which is just Dear not God. working. Like this zone it's is so not bad. working, and so that let. Guys like Dejon Davis and Emmett Matthews, who do not play in the first game, were huge in this game. Uh, Davis had five assists. He had nine points, hit hit three of his four field goals, you know, three of six from the line. You know, he got to the free throw line. Emmett Matthews, he had 15 points. It only took him, you know, 11 shots to get there and four free throws. He had five boards, three offensive rebounds. Nate Roberts, uh, who was really ineffective in the first game, he made all he you know he had a bunch of easy buckets and and he was causing havoc on the offensive glass um you know overall they did fine on the offensive glass but there were some really crucial times when they couldn't get a yep. board um and, and because the defense isn't playing as well uh they're they're kind of more likely to give up a bucket after they get that offensive rebound um yep. but yeah it's it they it I don't know what the fascination with is with the zone. I get it. You know, if you feel like you're not stopping guys, uh, for if you're trying to limit penetration, but they're still getting in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Without they were still having to dribble. There. It's like an easy yeah. pass or it's, you know, two easy dribbles to the middle. Cause we're just yeah. not, we're not good at the zone. Like you dub plays their zone all the time and they're, yeah. only okay at it like they're they're not even an elite defense by any measures and they play their zone constantly and they and yeah. they have built a roster to play that zone 
and they're and they're they're not great at it and we're just throwing it out there usually in the second half and it's just giving up points well, i don't was, know it was pretty yeah, good last year right like w- without having any you know synergy data or anything like that that says you know how i would say it was pretty good like you know what the points per ago. possession were yeah I, I feel like it was still pretty good last year you know again this it's totally anecdotal right because we don't have synergy data to back back up um you know what the points per possession are when they're running certain sets so you know i get all that but you know it's 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 bad this year and that's and that's pretty well, obvious and, and, and why is you know you look you look at it what, who did they have at the top of the zone the last two years? Who do they have at the top of the zone now? Right. Right. Like, yeah, it's, you have, I mean, you, you, you went from if, going, your top, your, your shortest guy was six, three, the last two years in that zone. And now your shortest guy is, is, you know, five, five, whatever, five, eight, five, nine, five, ten, whatever you think he actually is. Um, and then your second guy, by the way, is six feet tall. So good luck, I guess. Like, well, and it's a very even different if, prospect. Even if, even if they're not playing together, usually one of them's on the floor. So you still have one guy and right. You know, it's, you're taking away the strength of a lot of your players, which is man to man defense. Right. You know, we do have, you know, we can be long on the back, but it doesn't matter if they're getting wide open shots in the corner and wide open shots at the top of the key. uh, Or those big guys are having to kind of help on a pass and we just don't, rotate that well because it's yeah. just not something we do all the time like the rotations if, are slow it's just yeah ugh, well i was gonna say like, if my theory is correct that they're tired and you know kyle smith would know that better than anybody right yeah like he would know better than anybody if their legs are kind of toast um which would sort of explain the decision to go to the zone right but yeah. the problem is when when you're running out the personnel that we run out, the zone actually to be effective requires a ton of effort. Like it's not, you know, if you're running guy, you know, if you're running a bunch of dudes out there who are, you know, six five, six 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 seven on the perimeter, and you they can sort of alter in. shots just by being tall, then, you know, yeah, maybe you can catch a blow on the defensive end by running zone. But the that but the problem is we can't right. Like the way the players that we have, they're not. You know, they're not resting at all if you run a zone. And if they do, is this is what you get, <laughs> right? Which is which is what we got, you know, a pretty shitty zone that really didn't prevent a lot of good shots. I mean, the times when the zone has been effective this year, um, tired legs or not, it have really just been when people have missed shots. And um, that does happen. I mean, sometimes it's not a bad strategy to dare people to shoot. But, um, you know, it's, it really has been very dependent on whether the other team is hitting shots and, and has much less to do with the way that we guard people in the zone. You know, and we, we harp on the defense a lot because this team is very much built on their defense. And so it's, it's frustrating when, when the defense is something that loses the game. Um, Cause really what the U dubs output per possession wasn't too terribly different from Wednesday to sa- sa- Saturday. Yeah. It was about the same, a little, but, a little WS- later, but about the WSU, same. Went from one point two to one. Flowers goes off. Absolutely cannot miss in the first half. Drops thirty. It, it, I mean, if you tell me he's having that game, wow, because he did barely. You know, he had twelve points the first game. But FA, they did not give him that. You know, they were kind of they they paid way more attention to the middle. FA one offensive rebound in this game after ten in the last game. And then you have Noah and Tyrell just combining to do very, just struggle. Uh, Noah want two of 13, three turnovers, uh, and then Ty three of 12 and just a turnover, which is, you know, pretty standard for him. But, uh, but you know, when you have two of your biggest shot takers, Going, going five what, of 25. Yeah, five of 25. And two <laughs> of 10 on threes. Two of 10 on threes. You're you're kind of fucked. Uh, and, then, and then you don't have yeah. F.A. just getting, you know, clean. They still rebounded, offensive rebounded pretty well. 
but they weren't getting like the easy putbacks that they got in the first game because it wasn't FA yep. getting them. And FA is f- far and away the best at getting the ball, like r- converting his offensive rebounds back into points. Um, Cause he usually is just in the best position and with his athleticism, he can, he can get in there, but um, you know, D- Deshaun's very good at it too. I put Mo yep. at a far away three on, on in terms of converting the offensive rebound points, but, but, uh, but yeah, so FA doesn't, you know, barely a factor. It takes four shots, you know. I, I, I mean, he's a factor on defense, but just not on offense. And you know, Rodman doesn't do much, and he puts twenty one. You you get twenty one minutes from Rodman, and and he's not giving you anything offensively, which is normal. But you kind of hope he gets a couple buckets, you know, and um yeah. and, and and it's and and, and he's. He's such a good on-ball defender, and you're and when you're playing so much zone in the second half, you kind of take away a lot of his uh, what he does well. Um, so yeah, you get the thirty from Flowers, and then not much else, and then so you drop from one point two to one point per possession, fifteen of forty three on two pointers, which we've talked about the two point struggles with this team, and thirty five percent, thirty five percent. Thirty-five uh, percent in that game, which is gonna be funny when we talk about the next game. But 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 yeah, this is just frustrating. I mean, it's it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility of what you would expect our offense to do against their defense. But when they just went one point two on Wednesday and they go one point oh, yeah, yeah, that's it's frustrating. frustrating. I mean, it's they they couldn't you know they again as someone who didn't you know really watch the the early parts of the game. I mean. You know, late they just they just couldn't get they couldn't get inside. You know, and, and I mean they couldn't really, get inside you know, at the start either. It was just flowers yeah. hitting five three pointers in the first half. You know, I mean, just as we mentioned, you know, they changed up the way they were defending. Um, you know, and, and look, I mean, you knew after Wednesday they were not good. <laughs> like they were they not going to let us beat them in the same fashion. Like that just was not going to happen. You knew that. There was no chance whatsoever that they were going to allow Mo and F.A. to, you know, essentially put Roberts in that spot repeatedly uh, again. And then you also knew that there was a zero percent chance that Terrell Brown was only going to take like, you know, 13 shots like that. That just that was impossible. You knew it wasn't going to happen and it didn't happen. So, um, you know, what we failed to do is we you know, we we failed to adjust back. Um you know, and this is something that that we've kind of talked about, you know, off off the off the podcast. And so, you know, I don't want to go, you know, super deep into it, but you know, I've had this feeling just for a while this season that just like it, virtually everything with this team has just been just kind of a notch below where it needs to be. Um, and you know, some of that is, you know, players and the way they're playing. Um, some of that's coaching. Right. Like putting the team in, you know, positions to succeed. You know, we look at that zone. I mean, there there may have been good reasons to go to the zone, but the fact of the matter is it's horrible. Right. Um, you know, personnel decisions. We you know, we've talked before about, um, you know, what it means to play two guards who are real small in this conference and, and what a challenge that is, uh, you know, on both ends of the floor in terms of, you know, on offense, getting your shots and on defense guarding, you know, longer players. Um, and then, you know, you, you look at other things like, you know, injury luck, like, okay, we need, we need our injury luck to be a little better. You know, Deshaun Jackson, we've seen what a difference he can make since yeah. he's come back and, you know, missing him for a month and a half was, you know, problematic. And, um, you probably, you know, you could potentially argue they win a couple, at least a couple more games. Yeah. If Deshaun I think that's totally there. fair. And then you look at what's happening right now with Andre and Bamba, both of whom are clearly not a hundred percent at the moment. Um, you know, this team has just had, you know, kind of bad luck. And then we've, we've talked about the bad luck in terms of opponent shooting, right? Like, you know, other teams hitting shots that, you know, they don't, they don't normally hit. Right. Or, or at the very least, um, you know, just seeming to kind of hit them repeatedly. It's just, you know, things have just been not quite good enough. And some of that is luck and some of that is skill. And some of that is, you know, coaching or whatever, but, Um, you know, when you add it all up, that's how you end up with a team that's got probably, you know, four more, three or four more losses than they probably should have. Right. And so, um, I, I don't know, man, I just tend to kind of, 
chalk it up to, man, it's just, sometimes it's like that, <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes it's like that. Sometimes, uh, you know, players, sometimes it's just not, you know, what it needs to be. I mean, we were joking tonight watching, you know, Wisconsin, <laughs> you know, banking a three to beat Purdue. And it's just like, you know, what the hell, man? Like we can't, we can't seem to buy any of that luck. Although I guess it, it came back around a little bit against Oregon state, but, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just hard and it's frustrating. And, um, you know, we just don't seem to be able to push the right buttons, you know, when we need to push the buttons. I mean, when Washington wasn't allowing, uh, you know, the bigs to beat us, it seems like we should have been able to counter punch and then, and, you know, we just couldn't, and maybe that's just a matter of making shots. I mean, you know, Roberts and, and, and Williams have to be better than that. Maybe it's just as simple as that. Um, yeah, I don't know, but you know, this team's just kind of, you know, they've got holes. We've talked about this before, you know, they've got, they've got holes, they've got spot, you know, at Wazoo, you're usually going to have some holes. And, you know, when we were watching Tony Bennett in 2008, we saw all those holes exposed against North Carolina, right? We went, okay, we're really good. Maybe we got a chance to do this. And then North Carolina plays and you're like, yeah, it's, a, yeah, we, it's a, you know, I, I, unless we make every shot, I'm not sure we can compete with the athletes they're throwing out there. So yeah, um, there's always going to be holes and the holes just seem to have gotten exposed at really bad times this year. And, you know, I, I guess that sometimes that's how it goes. And then, you know, other times you get the Oregon state game, which, uh, which, you know, I can't say it was a good game, but you know, it was, was, uh, the result was pretty great. So I, I, I've been thinking about something a lot about the luck this year. And I, I emailed, uh, uh, Ken Pomeroy about it. And I asked him, you know, have you looked at, uh, you know, any, are there any associating factors, um, you know, some, some good correlations with luck and like experience you know, and, or something. Yeah. Like experience and stuff. But he said, you know, he has looked at that cause you would think it's experience or, or maybe having a guy with, who's like a, a major, you know, a go-to guy, which we don't have a guy that uses that many possessions or a major contributor that has a certain, um, you know, offensive rating or something like, uh, like the guy from Providence who's, who, um, the, the guard who, who wins them a lot of late games. I can't, I, I can't remember, um, what his name is at the, off the top of my head, but, um, but you know, obviously WSU doesn't have a person like that, but you know, he kind of said it's not really, like there, there, there are anything like anything that always, cause you could look at experience. So you look at a team like province, very experienced and they're winning all these close games, but there's a lot of other experienced teams that are not winning all those close games that are mid like, like Gonzaga has shitty luck. Like uh, they're not like they have, they're not like super experienced, but they also are super talented and they've won. So they've won fewer games than Ken Palms. <laughs> formula would expect them to win uh but the funny thing is that caveat right there but he said like it's mostly has to do with the better team usually wins but for you dub based on his number or for for you dub and in a lot of other get you know close games we've lost based on his numbers the better team has not won you know, you could say the the close loss to Boise State, the maybe the better team won that one and the two USC games. But then WSU has a bunch of other losses where they are the higher ranked team and they lost the close game. Um, so it's it's just what what is it? You know, and and maybe finally this uh, it came around against Oregon State where, like Ken said, it's just the better team usually prevails in these games and. And that's exactly what happened after one of the, you know, after coming off this, after the, the second half of UW combined with the first half of Oregon State, Cougar Twitter, Cougar fans were absolutely Ugh. lit so bad. I mean, I was pissed. Obviously, we're always a little more pissed and slack than we are on Twitter. Um, but it's, but it's, yep. uh, so it was so bad that the, the team had to turn off their <laughs> replies know, on Twitter because so people yeah, were the social so mad. media. Okay. So the social media team at Wazoo basketball turned off replies on Twitter so that they didn't have to, uh, experience Cougar fans being disappointed by giving up 98 fucking points in, in two, two halves. halves of basketball. Our defense, which 
going in to the first U Dub game was number one in points per possession. Yes. And and also, you know, for for the people who aren't into tempo free stats, was also the number one team in points allowed because of our pace. So that would makes right. the ninety eight points even more insane. We were average, yeah. we were giving up sixty two points per forty minutes before that. Completely like so, insane. like like to give net to two not good offenses, like middling in all of college basketball offenses, lower Pac twelve offenses to give up ninety eight points in two halves. Like I, it, you just you know you think God, they're so tired. Maybe they're maybe that this. Losing all these close games, losing five in a row, all this stuff has beaten them down to the point where they just they cannot give that effort anymore. And so after that first half, where where they down forty eight thirty seven, um, yep. and you're just like, oh my gosh, like this this is this sucks. Like we're gonna we're gonna come back and lose to one of the worst Pac twelve teams of all time. Like after, you know, just like a cherry on top of this, like frustrating fucking season. But, you know, what I was looking for when that second half came out, you know, we were playing good offense in the first half. It's just like the defense was abysmal. Too many open yeah, I mean, looks. 37 it, points in the first half they should, could, be, should be okay. So right? they That's largely okay put, place. they largely put Noah um, in the first half on and Noah and you know, flowers, I think a bit on to Sean Davis and he, they could not stay in front of him. So it looked a lot like the UW game. Um, but they didn't abandon and go to the zone. They did it eventually in the second half. Uh, but, but he was just shredding them. And the biggest benefit benefactor was Roman Silva, who was just getting wide open layups and dunks over and over and over again, or fouled and sent to the line, which he's a very good free throw shooter for a big, Yep. Um, and then, and then you got Maurice Kalu, who we joked before the game, <laughs> we were talking about like, yep. well, we, we think like Ty has been we're bad. Like, we know who's, we know who's going to take, we, we know, know who's, who's going to have the absurd game tonight. Dude, it's that guy. dude with, dude with the 82 offensive rating who, who just launches everything is going to go off. Yeah. And then, you know, he hits three or four I mean, threes. He's, he's just going yeah. nuts in the first half. So there, you know, there's combination of we're getting beat by Deshaun Davis. Like he is that, that was legitimately bad defense by, by just letting him get in the lane, um, which he's a very, that's what he does. He's good at that, Yeah. but still yeah. that you, even with that Oregon state's office hasn't been very good. Um, but you know, they, they came out in the second half and you're just hoping they show some more effort. And then, you know, they put Bamba on Davis, and Bamba did a serv- very serviceable job. Uh, moved Noah off the ball. Uh, and then you saw th- them go to the zone a bit, and that was sucky. Then they went back in the man, <laughs> and you yeah. saw Ty Roberts just was getting owned by Jared Lucas, which in a way that you don't see Jared Lucas score very often was in the in like – in, in the post and, and in just mid range jumpers because he's got, you know, six inches on tie at least. Um, but then I, you know, one thing that impressed me, I I'll say, I said in the chat, like I was so frustrated because Davis was just shredding us. And I kind of sarcastically said like, well, Kyle, you've said that Ty Roberts is your best on ball defender. So fucking put him on Davis. If if that's true, put him on Davis. Like, this is the guy. And <laughs> that And he did. And Ty did a hell of a job for the last, like, four minutes yeah, of the game. Yeah, he did, actually. Just, like, the biggest thing was he just had to keep him in front of him. You know, like, that's, he had to keep him out of the paint. Davis is not a and good that's something shooter. Roberts can definitely do. Like, even in that game winner against USC, like, Boogie Ellis didn't get by him he just you know shot over him right because he's you know five ten and that's or whatever what lucas is and it's that's what yeah. lucas was doing he was shooting over him but davis is not a good shooter no and so he'll hit some wide open two-point jumpers which we saw yep. but he's not going to shoot from three like you just have to keep him from creating havoc in the lane and ty did that and that kind of enabled them to 
come back in the la- in the final minutes. And 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 I'll say and then the move to put Noah then off the ball onto Lucas uh yep. was very good cuz Noah just kind of shut down Lucas said he fouled him once and got him a couple free points, but other than that um he was just denying Lucas down the stretch and in overtime. Lucas got a couple like gimme layups when we had the big lead at the end, but um I I did I was confused. They came out of that under four and Bamba wasn't on the floor. And Bamba had bit I I know they love plus minus, and Bamba's plus minus had to be like the best on the team in that game. Cause when he came well, I can on tell you, hold on. Go ahead. Keep talking. I'll find it. But because when he came on in the in the second half, you know, they, they put him on in the first half. When he came on in the second half, they, they started with the second half, and that's when they made their run to get back in the game. And a lot of it was Bamba being able to get to the basket, Bamba playing better, de- you know, c- containing Davis a little more. Um, so it was a little, it was a little uh, surprising to see. But I will say they ended up putting him in with about two minutes left, and that's when they really made their push. Uh, to to win uh, or to, to he might have been it's entirely possible to think he's on a minutes restriction too yeah uh, no 100 percent just because yeah. he he hasn't played much all right so here's your answer uh bomba indeed led the team at plus 11 tied with uh flowers who was also plus 11 so there you go man how bad were they when flowers came off the floor then because he played 41 <laughs> he played 41 of 45 minutes yeah and, of 45 and, and minutes. So, 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 wow. So they must, yeah. they and were they, minus five when he, and they, and they minus, only won uh, by, yeah, they only won by, they won by six. So he's minus five when they were off. They were minus five when he was off the floor. Well, it'll be more than that, right? Like, I don't know. Cause if they were minus five well, they and were, plus six, if they're plus six when he's on the floor and minus five no, no, when they're off, plus they would only he's win plus, by one. He's plus 11. He's plus, plus 11. 11. Okay. They won by six. So they're minus so five. They Minus five went for those four minutes. He was okay. Off the floor. So, so yeah, but he needed those four minutes. The dude has played a lot of minutes. <laughs> um, Catch a break. But overall, this FA, is by this... the way, FA, by the way, was minus 10. Ugh. They, yeah, he did he, not have a they didn't, game. they didn't even, he got almost no time in the second half. He really struggled with, uh, with the big guy, Roman, uh, Roman Silva. Yep. Is. Yeah, Silva. Which he, he really struggled you know, with Silva. He struggled with the switches and the when and they the when they did put him back time. on when they did put him back on the second half. They actually put him on Kalu. Yep, uh, which was probably a good decision. <laughs> which yeah, it was probably a great decision because Kalu's just going to shoot. So okay, so let FA. The problem is, and then so you know Kalu's going to draw him away from the basket. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's, so that's obviously takes not away where a, you want FA. So takes away a big yeah. part. So of not a, not a great matchup for our big guy. That's okay. We still love him. Uh, Deshaun Jackson had a great game. 16 minutes, uh, 10, 10 points. points, six Go rebounds. Ahead, free throws. <laughs> um, yep. But five. Yeah, except for the free what throws. What Deshaun is, in the time he has been able to play this year, he's been our best offensive rebounder. And he was huge on that in this game. And that's that's not a shock, by the way. Like, we knew that from last year. Like, yep. he, the rebounding is so much better, like on both ends. The rebounding is so much better when he's on the floor. On the offensive end, I I don't know. I, I can't remember. I'm not looking at it right now. Like I don't recall him having a super high offensive rebounding percentage last year, um, but he does get his hands on a lot of balls, um, keeps a lot of balls alive. And then defensively, on the defensive rebounding, he's just kind of a he's kind of a Hoover man. He gets yeah, his hands he was, on a lot of balls. He was definitely pulls him he down. Was good. He was good offensive rebound last year. This year he's been elite. At yeah. offensive rebounding. Yeah, he's he is a superior rebounder. Um just you know, he takes up a lot of space, he's got big hands. Well yeah, he's arms. not he like gets his hands on a lot of balls. He's, he doesn't he's a get, really good rebounder. He doesn't get a lot of defensive rebounds, but he unlike FA and uh and Mo, he's a good complement to them because he actually boxes guys out yes, with his size. He takes up space. Where F I F A M O are just kind of they're using their athleticism to just jump over guys to get the rebounds. Let's be honest; like they're not they're not boxing yep. people out. They don't need to. They're NBA, They have NBA athleticism. Um, go go look at the elite rebounders in the NBA. They don't fucking box box people out. They just jump over people. Right. They just go you know? get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so it's but Deshaun has that big body and uses very well. Uh, again, talking about how you know we lose this game if Deshaun doesn't play his whatever seventeen minutes whatever yes. he plays. I think that's um, I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, we might have won in regulation if he could have hit some free throws, but well, yeah, yeah, that's all right. Hey, even so, this was uh, a dream game offensively for both teams. Like this was one of the most bonkers games. Like I don't it. it it's it's hard to appreciate because it, it, during the time you're just like, can we not lose to this team? But yes. this was seriously an insane game. Yes. Uh, and, and, like, and it was sort of it was way uh, not as exciting as it should have been because the crowd was so damn lame. Like, it, it, and if anything, if the if the um, you know if the pandemic taught us anything about like tv broadcasts and and sports it's that the crowd is actually really a player right even on tv broadcasts right like yeah. the crowd is like a legit thing oregon state's crowd was like non-existent and you had this like absolutely batshit bonkers game with two th- two teams scoring like 1.4 points per possession back and forth you know basically averaging 100 points between them in overtime and it was just kind of like, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it should have been like the craziest fucking game um, in terms of excitement. And it, it was kind of hard to get it with, you know, basically nobody in the arena. But, you know, but it, it, it was a crazy, interesting game for sure. Ev- every single player that qualified that played more than 10 minutes in this game and even Ahmad Rand, who all played seven, would be in this, too, if, if he qualified, were over 100 offensive rating. Like Which is every crazy. single player, even Noah Williams, <laughs> like like everyone. That does not happen in games that we play. That doesn't happen in games that we play, both because, because of we, our offense and our we, defense. And, and their defense, exactly. And so that was nuts. And Ty Robert, so WSU shot 69% nice on two-pointers. Tyrell <laughs> Roberts, five foot eleven listed. Tyrell Roberts went five of five on two pointers. Five of five. <laughs> well, you know, it's nice when the other team doesn't bother to try and stop you. You know, Jared when you're going Lucas for a, a layup. Might Jared Lucas might be one of the worst defenders I've ever seen. At least on might ball be. defenders. Yeah, might be. He could not he's got five inches at least on Ty, and he could not stay in front of him enough could not, to not, bother a on, shot. Yeah. I guess you could look at it either way, but yeah, could not or would. But not. He, I don't know. Yeah, or would not. Just would not even. Just, just didn't even just care. Wasn't even really uh, trying. Yeah. So he, I mean, if Ty Ty missed like a bunch of wide open threes in this game, he has a huge game yeah. if he can just knock down those threes. Um, biggest thing, he shot three free throws in this game. He had shot Woo! nine nine free throws. In the previous 17 conference games before this, <laughs> I tweeted so out, I tweeted out when he shot, when he, he drew the and one near the start of the first half, that was his yeah. 10th free throw attempt of the, of the conference season. And I had multiple people like, that's insane. You're wrong. I'm like, nope, it's, it's true. Nope. Nope, 10 it's free, he's now shot 12 free throws and he missed the 12th, which would have won the game in regulation. I know that was but another free throw to his credit played, played a hell of a defensive final possession to force the overtime, stopping the guy that had completely destroyed us, did exactly what we're talking about, forced him into a jump shot, um, which he airballed by a long, long shot. Um, so yeah, but it is insane. And then, and that, like the comeback in the second half, I mean, even you you gotta admit, like, you knew they were gonna get back in the game. Like Oregon State sucks. Like you knew Oregon State was not gonna blow them out as long as they didn't well, and give up. The and so thing when is they Oregon came State's out, defense is horrendous. Like we, yeah, like there will be opportunities to score points as long as you you know keep your effort, your energy level up. And they did. You could tell in the first, you know, what you wanted to see in the first five minutes, of the second half. That they're trying, they did. They trimmed it to like eight pretty quickly, or like six, and then they they had it down. You know, they trimmed the lead down, and then it was just kind of a back and forth battle a bit to it down the stretch. Um, finally got 
you know, I would even say like it wasn't like a super lucky ending of 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 regulation. You know, you force an eighteen percent three point shooter into a three pointer, a, a yes. step back into three a pointer, three pointer, and, yeah. and he misses it. Well, yeah, and and you on the other end, you had your ninety five percent free throw shooter miss a free throw that would have won the game. I don't know, like we, I don't know if we got lucky there, but when we went to overtime, I had a pretty good feeling because we had just dominated basically the last twenty minutes. You know, but we were plus eleven the last twenty. And it felt like we kind of... And then, by the way, we hit 8 of 9 free throws in the overtime. <laughs> after going 8 of 17. <laughs> after going 8 of 17 in regulation. If we would have just hit I, that s- percentage in regulation. Like Oregon State did. Talk about luck. 19 of 20. Yeah. 19 say, of listen, 20. Say it with me, everybody. Free throws are random. Not that the overall percentage is random, but the sequence of free throws in any given game is going to be random. You're going to shoot 8 of 17 for the first 40 minutes, and then you're going to hit 8 of 9 in overtime, including Mo Gay going yeah. four, 4 of 4. After a 95% free throw shooter goes 1 of 2, to right. accept, like our our 50% free throw shooter goes 4 Could of put 4, us up which, by, by the way, 15 seconds to go. He, yeah. has hit, he has hit 8 of his last 9. You know, maybe maybe all those jumpers in that UW game, like maybe. fix something for him. I don't know. Like maybe might have been getting it. off twenty jumpers. It was just like a nice workout for him because he hit three of three in that game, and then he yep. hits four or four in this game. Uh, yep. I'm sorry, five of six, four or four in the overtime. Uh, maybe that's he had it. the one of the really one of the like. We'll talk about Mike. We'll get to Mike. Uh, he deserves all the all the praise but like mo had one of the quietest 19 point performances like i did not re- i looked at the box score i did not realize that he had 19 points yeah um and he hit seven of seven again this team which is still last by a by at least a percentage point in conference play in two point percentage shoot 69 percent I you know I was talking to some friends after and they're they're like you know wow it's nice to see us get to the bucket and I'm like yeah it's nice it's nice that we did it and we didn't just sit back and launch threes which by the way we still did but we hit 42 percent of them so that's yeah, pretty good yeah um, we still took 26 of them yeah but it's Oregon State's defense is so bad like they're oh so God. bad. Like it, so it when Ty Roberts is getting five layup. I mean, one of them was a really incredible finish, but when he's getting yes. three other, and then one was a nice little finish uh, on the foul. So three wide open layups. Two of them yes. were in half court. One was kind of half transition where he just they just didn't. They were all back. They just didn't defend him. Like he no, like, they didn't. They didn't saw, rotate. They just watched they, him go. They, he, they just you saw him, him run the all the way to the bucket. It was like hey. Look at that. He, he just did get gave, to see, I felt like he kept looking around going like where's where's the help defense coming from? And then it's like we did oh, get to see his his I guess quickness. it's not coming. Because once he saw that hole, he was like there. Yes. You know, yeah, and there was a couple times get, where he had a nice little burst for sure. We did get our bank three in this game from Noah, which we Noah did. deserves a bank three. Come on. Yes, he does. <laughs> um and then and then and then Mike, man, like this is you need performances like this late in the season when the legs are tired and yep. the defense ain't working or, or, you know, other guys aren't, aren't working. And, um, and it helps to, you know, we've talked about, we, we do turnover avoidance to the fault, but turnover avoidance was big in this one. They only turned it over eight times in what's, you know, 75 possessions. Uh, that's pretty yeah. damn good. Um, and so, uh, and then Mike just, uh, huge buckets. He's, he's a, he's a great tough shot. He's, he's a great tough shot maker and that the, the, you know, the pull up three that he hit to basically ice the game with about, you know, just over a minute left, 90, make it 96, 90 was such a tough shot that not a lot of guys can make. And, but he was feeling it and, and that was a big shot. And, and, and that effectively ended the game 
Uh, you know, you're up six with a minute to go. Uh, it, it kind of felt like we had already ended the game a little bit earlier, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then we still just, I, it, it was kind of weird. There was just under a minute left and we kind of just let Oregon state go down and lay the ball up. I, I <laughs> like yeah. shit could still happen here guys. Um, yes. uh, but, but you know, I guess they just had to be on brand for the game because Oregon yep. State just let Mo Gay dribble down the middle of the court and dunk the ball. <laughs> like with, right, and with then like we let 15. them come back with, and with then lay it up <laughs> with two seconds We're, left or whatever. So it's wild. Like this, one point four one points per possession. One point four. Whenever it's over, it Kempom rounds up, but uh, yeah. highest per play. In conference, in a conference game, in the pack, in the Ken Palm era, which goes back to the o one o two season. So we're talking, we're looking at the most effective Did offensive not realize performance. That. Yeah, it's, this, it's third overall, highest against a Pac twelve team, Pac ten, Pac twelve team, in the Ken Palm era. We just saw like literally history, <laughs> like that. We we there's been we've played. Teams as bad as this in comp- – like, Pac-12 has had some pretty bad teams at that time. Some Cal teams, some other Oregon State teams, even some Oregon teams. Um, it, never have they put up 1.4 points per possession in league play in the last 21 years or 20 years, I guess. So that was yep. pretty impressive. Uh, and they needed all of it. <laughs> yeah, to- to survive in in overtime 103 point it's so funny because we always focus so much on the per play and the tempo free but then you look at there was 200 points in this game i know there's something magical about what was like you mentioned that um you know that you didn't realize how many points you know mo had scored in the game and i was like this is such like an nba box score right like you got mm-hmm. you got someone with 27 you got someone with 19 you got a you know three guys 12 11 and 11 you know, guys off the guy bench scoring double digits right you got a guy you got two guys off the bench scoring in double digits like it's just yeah it was a very nba very nba top box score um in, a, in an almost nba type you know time frame right 45 minutes um yeah just funny it, you know it was a fun game mike flowers i just like i can't heap enough praise on the guy um he just has been you know so so good and obviously he's had some bad games i mean you know players are gonna have bad games like i don't I, our, our fans seem to tend to focus um a lot <laughs> on on guys bad games um instead of focusing on you know the good things that they do and you know, Flowers, I mean, we're looking at a guy who scored 27 against Oregon State, 30 against Washington, um, had 12 against UW in the first matchup, and, you know, had a, had a little run there against UCLA, USC, Washington, where he was just kind of so-so, but, um, you know, scored 23 against Oregon. I mean, the, the guy's the guy's a baller, man, and he's, um, you know, unlike, you know, other guys who seem to be getting, you know, real, real tired, um, you know, he seems to be able to, at this point, sustain his energy. And that's, uh, you know, that is huge. That, that's huge for this team and, you know, huge for maybe trying to win a couple games this weekend. Uh, you know, it'd be really, really tough for them to push their way up to, uh, up to fourth. Um, if they do, there's going to be a multi-team tie. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say it, like, um, you know, in my Monday column, I wrote, there would be a three-way tie. There actually be a four-way tie because yeah, Washington would have to beat Oregon yeah. yep. and we would have to beat Oregon and Colorado would have to lose to Utah, and there would be a four-way tie for fourth, and I have no idea how the tiebreaker yeah. would work out on that. Because um, so. it's because if we tie with Colorado, they beat Arizona, so we that, that's the tiebreaker. If we tie with uh, uh, Oregon, they beat UCLA, so that's the tiebreaker. Uh, so we just can't – those are the teams that we could tie with in fourth place, and so we can't – Right, but it know, would be a four-way tie. It has to if be. If it a happened, four- it would be. It, a, it would have to be a four way. That's the only way it can happen. And then I'm guessing it would be the record against the other three teams or something. Probably, um, which I would have. Yeah, again, like like I wrote on Monday, like I, no desire at all to try and figure that 
try and figure they're probably out, but... like even if they win these two games, they're probably going to be like a six seed. Yeah, like, you would think that's probably right. But I, I, but I didn't want to get into okay. much into into like the seeding because we'll just know that after these games. No, I mean <laughs> it's the the number of because of the bunch in the middle, it, just the number of uh, you know possibilities is, is just way too large. So yeah, it's it's and and but even the most likely possibilities are still like it's it's very unlikely that WSU could finish fourth and get a buy. Like yes. it's very unlikely. Even See, if they win, unlikely. even if they win, yeah. even if they win their two games, they need a lot yeah, of stuff that, to happen. That loss to Washington was was kind of the big one. Like that yep. was, you really needed to win both of those, and then you know basically you need to win all five. Out, right? You need to, yeah, you so, needed to win the last five. Yeah. Yep. So, but that's okay. I mean, like, listen, if they win these last two games, they will finish with eleven conference wins, right? So they'll be eleven and nine. Uh, it'll be their first winning record in the Pac-12 in ten yep, years. That's the that's the um, real stakes for me. Those are big. Is, thi- those are big yeah. things, man. Yep. And they're probably going if they win the last two games, probably lock into NIT bid. Which I like. Honestly, again, I've said it before. We as Kook fans cannot stick our nose up at, at an NIT. No. Hell, because no. we've had we've had throughout our basketball history, ha- even some of our top teams have struggled to qualify for the NIT. Our best coaches went to the NIT. Kelvin Sampson, Tony Bennett, NIT guys. You know, and well, I guess was Sampson was no, Sampson was had left. And so it was Sampson's roster. Yep, that but. was that's when I was there. It was uh, Kevin Eastman. It, it, it was Kevin uh, Eastman. So Kevin right, Eastman. And they, so they made to the NIT. Strike that. They were but, supposed, but, they were supposed but, to go to the tournament. But Mark, Mark Henderson, Henderson got his hand yeah. and then yeah. everything went sideways, but yeah, it's but it was Samson's still a big deal for us. It was so. Samson's roster, and but the, yeah. but but yeah, Tony Bennett with Aaron Baines and and Clay Thompson and Taylor Rochester went to the NIT, and Clay Thompson we had Clay Thompson and we went to two NITs with him. So yeah. NITs, you know, like and it's a step. It's a step in the right direction. We've had a shitty season. If we can still be in a tournament in some sort of tournament that's that you don't have to pay to play in like that's yep. that's a step and they, yep. they they might not even need to win both of these games to do that but i i would love to see you know the yeah, first i think they do yeah they if probably do honest, well, i think they it do. depends on it's you know, the rec the record matters um yeah and the record is still pretty iffy so you win these two games you finish with 18 wins um, heading into the conference tournament, you know, it, and you're in the conference tournament where you probably should get another win. Um, then, then you're feeling pretty good, but yeah, you, you, I don't know, man, you don't want to lose. You definitely don't want to lose to Oregon state. Um, you lose to Oregon, you know, whatever, I guess, but it's, uh, you know, I would say NIT is looking maybe a little I, get, I can tell that, you very that much point. that the PAC 12 is not going to want us to beat Oregon. No, no, so I am, not. I am not looking for, and I'm, that I'm game fully expecting to get refed in that game. Hardcore. Yeah. That game is also on CPS, which I, I had forgotten until this week. Uh, so we'll be there. We will have to be loud and, and maybe we'll get Absolutely. on national. Maybe we'll get on network TV, Jeff. Um, yeah, I think, I think we will. If people look close, they'll probably see us. I think that it'll be a big factor to have Deshaun in this game who we did not have. Yes. The last time against Oregon. Yep. It'll be a big factor yep. to be at home. I think these teams are pretty close in capability. Oregon has a higher ceiling. I, I think that's that's for sure. But in terms of their average ability, I the Oregon State game, if we lose that, then fuck, man. Like my bachelor party weekend is just going to have the worst goddamn start. <laughs> And we might have to cancel it. Just go they home. Cannot, no, I'm just kidding. They cannot lose that game. I yeah. I do not want to. I do not want to go through Friday and and leading up to the game on Saturday uh, with a loss. Hang that literally would be all we would talk about. That would be my oh entire my bachelor party. It would be us It'd talking be about horrible. we lost to fucking Oregon State. It'd be so horrible. don't. There's the every reason they should be able to. The 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 encouraging thing about the repeatable part 
of what they did against Oregon State that they can do again is the fact that they got easy shots in the paint. Yes. And and so you, it didn't. You would not expect Oregon State's defense to be better on the road than it was no. at home. So. And I would expect ours to be better at home. Um, I, I I think Oregon State played one of their best games of the year against us, honestly, at least offensively. They, I mean, we talked about Kalu and other guys just filling it up. So figure out how to stop Deshaun Davis. You know, make shots, beat Oregon State, Oregon. That should be a fun one, I think. I think it's be close. Um, I am hoping Deshaun swings it for us. Uh, did Bama Bama play in that one? I'm trying trying to remember. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that was. Then so. he sat the next couple out after that. I think is what it was. Um, so yeah, what you know that that first Oregon loss, you know, obviously offense wasn't, you know, was kind of what we expect, you know, at this point. Um, but the defense was good, and you know they, if if they just make more shots, you know they went fourteen and forty inside the paint. Deshaun will help with that, I think. Um, I hope. Uh, you know, hopefully Noah, uh, you know, feels the, you know, this is this is still like a big game. You know, they, they do have postseason aspirations. Maybe they're not the NCAA tournament, but Oregon is on the bubble. We can pop their bubble, and I guarantee, I guarantee that's a message that the coaches are going to say because that, that's fun. Like, you you want to motivate, like, we can ruin their season right now. Like, if, if we beat them right now, we can ruin their season. They need this quad one win on their resume. And we can steal it away. We can take it. Which also is a funny thing. We're the team that has no... Sh- like, uh, we, we'd have... Maybe would have to... Maybe, maybe, if we win these games and then re- went to the... And then beat UCLA and USC on the way to the conference championship, potentially would be somewhere yeah, near the bubble. But maybe that's what we have to do. Oregon basically needs... If they beat us, they'll, ugh, they'll they might be there. If they beat you, Dub, and beat us on the road, if they get this quad one win from us, it's a funny thing is that we've been offering up these quad one opportunities to so many teams all year. Yep. Uh, you know, Boise State's got a quad one because of us. Stanford's got a quad one because of us. USC's got a quad one because of us. Like, it's so funny that, like, because of our high net ranking, if someone beats us at home, they get a quad yep. one win. New Mexico State, quad one win for them. Uh, well, Boise State, not quite, because we're not in top 50 anymore. So sorry, Boise State. We fucked it up for you. But, but anyway, so, th- <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we just had to get had to get blown out by UCLA. Um, yep. But 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 yeah, so it's you know, th- there's this is a big weekend for Cougar basketball finishing above 500 in conference play for the first time in 14 years would be a big deal. It'd be huge. It'd be absolutely huge. Getting to an NIT. I feel like too many of our fans are sort of poo-pooing that. And it's, yeah. it's just, it's a big damn deal. Man. I don't, but I do think people understood. I think people are understood, understanding like as frustrating as this season would be just based on like, I, you know, I sent out a tweet that said, this is the first time they've won nine games of conference play since before the PAC 12 even, you know, was a league. Like, but when it was still the Pac-10, because it was Clay's last season, it was still the Pac-10. Right. That's when they went nine and nine. So we haven't been nine and nine since then. And that's been, you know, pe- people have been enjoyed that, and they're like, "Holy crap!" You know, like maybe, maybe this is the season has been frustrating and has not met everything that we want it to be, but we can make it a little bit better with this home weekend. And it's my bachelor party. Uh, can, yes. can you win the games and, we need and just that. make it I, selfishly make it the best weekend for me, you know, just, just for I, me I, I and, and my friends. It should, that, that should be the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, it should be, they should be, there should be a sign in the locker room. Make it Craig's best weekend, you know, make it, make it his best weekend. I plan my bachelor party around you guys, all you guys on this Cougar basketball team. That's how much I love Cougar basketball. So, 
please go ahead win these two games I, we already have other fun shit planned, so we're going to have fun regardless, but make it the maximum fun by winning the two games and you know finishing with that winning record. We'll be so happy. I'll, I'll be there screaming. I hope the students are too. You know, it's uh, we're an hour and four minutes. We're an hour and four minutes in. We haven't even taken a break, but yeah. Yeah, uh, so I, you know, they can win both these games. They should win Thursday. It, you know, it's kind of a toss up for Saturday, but they, I still think they should win that game too. Um, and I would love if they did because fucking over Oregon is fun as hell. Um, yes. So, 100%. Uh, so yeah, that's what that's what I have, that's my argument for it. Make me happy. I agree. All right. I agree. All right, Jeff. Let's let's go to break. Then we'll. We'll talk the women's team who has already done something historical, and we got to talk about that. Let's take a break. back all right but we, before we talk about this amazing uh women's basketball season um that still has not been properly recognized uh let's 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 recognize some quality beer jeff uh so yes. what are you drinking well i was drinking <laughs> well an hour and busy. five minutes ago you were yeah. drinking well it was both that, and also I started drinking it at eight thirty when we when we were supposed to start recording. Um, so this is the uh, it's now ten twenty brews. I know Ruben's brews uh, supreme triumvirate tenth anniversary series. So they've oh. they've uh, so it's Ruben's brews tenth anniversary, and uh, they've got um, you know a series of tenth anniversary beers. Um, I picked this one up at, at Rainier Growlers, not from Costco. I would like I would like to note. Um, so this is a, a collaboration with uh, with Brow. I know, right? Collaboration with Br- Browers and Bottleworks, and uh, it's an Imperial IPA of their uh, Triumvirate beer that um, you know apparently is is always on tap at, at Browers and, and Bottleworks, and so they made an Imperial yeah, it's, it's version their house the IPA basically. Yes. Um, and so it's, it's a, you know, it's a pretty classic West coast IPA. It is absolutely delicious. Um, love this beer. It's fantastic. And, um, would not, would not hesitate to drink another one. I will say that, um, the other, uh, the other one I saw that was, uh, in their 10th anniversary series was an Amber ale, um, which I thought was sort of hilarious because, and, and like, you know, each one of these cans has a little, um, you know, a descriptor on it or, or whatever, where they, they just kind of talk about what the, you know, what the beer is. And um, so the, the Amber Ale was, was sort of like, you know, we're, we're imagining a world where Amber Ales end up, you know, dominating uh, the beer scene like, like they did, you know, 10 years ago. I think it'll um, happen which again, I thought was, honestly. Was pretty funny. It's, you know, I, entirely possible. Um, I don't like them, but, you know, it's, uh, it, they're just, it, it's too, they're, they're too caramely, too sweet for me. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't really like that. 100%. but um, but it's, but it's also what, uh, it's also what got me into, you know, craft beer 10 years ago. So, you know, whatever. Yeah. Great beer. Great beer. Very excited. I'm, I, you know, uh, when I, when I go to Rainier Growlers, I can't, you know, resist, but, you know, pick up a bunch of stuff. So I've got, I've got some other fun things to, uh, drink through over the next couple of weeks when we record, or maybe I'll bring them to Pullman with me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so I, obviously, you know, that I have. Um, and, and say that I shared with you my uh, list of cellar beers I'm bringing to oh Pullman. Oh, my God. Yes. Um, Holy cow. Uh, but, yeah, so that's uh, uh, Amanda just said, how long until you're done? I'm going to say 20 minutes or so. <laughs> okay. Um, it's good to know that it's not only my wife that does that. <laughs> She'll say, when are you coming to bed? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know, you know, at some point. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, well, it was my daughter's first birthday today. Amanda's parents are here for that. They're staying the night. My office is off of the set, the extra bedroom. Um, so I'm preventing them from going to sleep. So sorry, blame technology. We would be done by now. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm pretty jealous about that Supreme Triumvirate. They didn't have the cans at Peaks and Pints. They did have it on Crowler, but they didn't want a Crowler of it. Um, so, uh, that did sound like a delicious one. I could have had it at Brower's on Saturday, but I did try barley wines mostly. Um, I did try one of the worst beers I've ever had. Uh, so J.W. Lee's is like a classic barley wine maker. Um, they do also dis- different cask treatments. You know, uh, they'll use brandy and uh, and bourbon and obviously all, all other types of ca- cask. Um, this particular one, I believe it was a brandy cask treatment. It was from 2010 barley wine. It had been fucked up at some point. Uh, it it was it had so it was pretty funny. I I ordered. I had a friend with me, and she was just like, "Just order, you know, just get me whatever barley wines you order. I'll just, I'll just get the same ones." So I ordered one for each of us, and the bartender was like, "Well, it's a bit much. Um, maybe you should just order one four ounce pour." Uh, so I was like, "Well, that's a bit alarming." So yes, and it literally had it had sour notes. This is a twelve year old beer that was also in a cask, like it was on cask. Um, so it was, you know, uh, so it had just been collecting all sorts of, uh, funky, you know, had the funky yeasties that started out with, that have just soured it up. And it also had a very distinct flavor of that really shitty peanut butter taffy Halloween candy. That's in like the black and orange wrappers, like the wax wrappers that like your worst neighbor would give you growing up. Um, I don't. I think they're called peanut butter surprise or some shit like that. They're awful, and that beer tastes like that, and it was awful. And I should have known. That's why uh, WC was going to lose to UW because I had such a shitty beer uh, right before I went. Um, but anyway, so what am I drinking now? Uh, I found out this week about. Well, I known about this brewery, but I, what I did find out this week, it's a, it's a what do you call a nano brewery, like very small brewery. Um, called Breakthrough Brewing out of the Seattle area. They they list Kent as that must be where they're brewing. Um, Kent on on their their cans. Um, the are uh, it is a Coog Run Brewery. Um, I did reach out to them. I'm still waiting on um, on uh, uh, Alex uh, who uh, runs a brewery there. Uh, to get back to me um, on it on you know a little bit more information uh, on the brewery itself, but I do know that they're kind of only package and draft now. You can't like I don't think you can go visit them or anything. They're very small, uh, but they're doing some good beer. Uh, I started with uh, Chili Bin New Zealand style Pilsner, um, so they use two uh, New Zealand style hops, Nelson Sauvin and, and Rawaka. New Zealand hops, New- Nelson Sauvin and Rawaka. And then they used Phantasm in there, which I've talked about before on the podcast. It is a powder derived uh, from a grape, a wine grape, um, basically. Uh, it, it, and so it, 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 they've found it. It gives like nice IPA notes. And so I, I had that and, and that was created in New Zealand. And so Chili Bin, New Zealand side pills or Chili Bin, I'm guessing, is some sort of New Zealand uh, description for a... Okay. I know um, the answer to this. Yeah, I what? know the answer to this. Yeah, go ahead. A so okay, so my my wife Sarah likes to watch uh, TikTok videos all the time, and there is a uh, a guy, an actor from New Zealand, who loves to uh, make videos talking about English, uh, American English words, and then um, New Zealand words for the same thing. Um, and I distinctly remember the chili bin. A chili bin is just their word for a cooler. Yeah. That's yeah, because that's what the chili bin chi- is the cooler. It's chili bin. It's got a nice like backdrop of probably like a New Zealand ski area or something. And then and then yep. chili bin is on top of like a cooler. And so that's what I figured. Uh, that's yes. 
Oh, and that's the such reason a great... I remember this is yeah. because Sarah and I were like, we resolved that for an entire summer we were going to go camping and call the cooler the chili bin, and we that's... tried, and we just we couldn't do it, but we tried. Oh, it's such a it good. Was it's such a good term. It's and it's such it's a perfect. very it's kind perfect. of commonwealth term for something a chili, chili bin. bin. <laughs> um, like, and that's spelled C H I L L Y. Like so, like chili, like the cold, way, not. The, the chili bin is such a better descriptor than a cooler. Like, yeah. it's a bin that's chilly. Like, why would you call it anything else? I don't know, but it, yeah. And, and your cooler's not supposed to cool things. It's supposed to keep cold things. Correct. You know? Correct. Keep them chilly. So, I don't know. So, yeah, New Zealand so that, style that Pilsner. Is, that is a chili bin. So, there you go. Very, very tasty Pilsner. Uh, well done uh, from Coog there. Um, and then I've also – I'm working my way on another one for Breakthrough uh, called uh, Hype Beer Checklist. Uh, so it's a hazy IPA. Uh, so it has this checklist down at the top. It says hazy or fruited, crossed off fruited, but hazy, check. Hype-worthy hops or products, Nelson, Strata, Strata Hop Hash, those are hype hops. Uh, Phantasm, again, this beer also has Phantasm. Thiol thiolized boosting yeast. Ooh. I, I, I don't know. That is a new one for me. It sounds uh, impressive though. Uh, like, and then it also says double dry hop exclamation point. Oh yeah. Check. Do you, we talked about double dry hopping. You gotta have double dry hopping. Um, so, uh, cause, so cosmic punch. So thiols are are the the flavor compounds, and the I think that that they're getting from the fanta phantasm as well, the phantasm powder. Uh, so uh, what this, um, th so this one's called Bursley Yeast Bank Tropics. So there's apparently they've made yeast now that kind of complement the thiol notes or thiol. I don't know if I'm saying it wrong or right or whatever. And so basically it just complements those hop flavors and, and it's like, we're just fucking sciencing up IPAs and it's a very good IPA. It's got a good body. Um, real nice note. You can tell they used like something beyond just regular hops to get the, the flavors. Um, very tasty, very drinkable. Um, it's a hazy IPA. What can I say? But it is, it is pretty damn pretty damn good and it's made by a coog so breakthrough brewing go check them out um when alex does send me more of that info i you know and i and i have a feeling maybe we'll do something uh with him at some point maybe have him on the podcast uh we'll we'll pass that along but if you do see breakthrough brewing in especially i think western washington probably is where you best can find it check them out like Give them a give them a try because they are a Coog brewery um, and they're doing some fun stuff. So uh, breakthrough B R E A K T H R U uh, is how it's spelled. Um, so breakthrough brewing. But Jeff, uh, now that we talked about beer for 15 minutes again, let's talk about uh, this uh, this women's hoops team who just set. Uh, the record for most uh, wins in the NCAA era, highest finish in conference play, most conference wins. Um, and none of that was good enough, according to the other coaches in the conference, for Cammie Etheridge to win coach of the year, though. Yeah, um, apparently not. T Tara Vanderveer. Oh, so ridiculous. Tara Vanderveer, who may objectively be the best coach in the conference, but also has built a super roster that that is full of yeah. WNBA players and should go, you know, should win the conference, should go somewhere near 15, you know, 16 and 0 and did uh one coach of the year. Uh I don't know, doing something your program has never done before seems like maybe you should win coach of the year, but what do I know? Uh, but hey, you know they—they they actually against that super team, 
put up a, one of the best fights they've they've put up. We we kind of already last week we were like they're gonna lose by they just don't lose this game by too much to ruin your net, and they didn't. They actually improved their net by yep. three spots by only losing by because yeah, by they, only losing by they, they lost, lost by five. seven. They held Stanford to sixty one points. Stanford has a bunch of fucking superstars on their team. Like th- we're giving up three four inches at multiple positions because there's they're you know they're they have six two guards that have skills like charlie's you know multiple six two guards that have skills like charlie's and and, and charlie's is like five nine by the way um and but they you know this team has just been so good defensively one blip against uh oregon other than that just a very good defensive team and and that kept them in the game in Stanford, uh, allowed them to build a big lead that they uh, didn't quite lose against Cal. Uh, but uh, you know, I didn't get to watch the uh, the Cal game because um, it was uh, during the Sounders. Uh, what, I believe it was during the Sounders on Sunday, um, uh, or no Saturday. It was during it was. It, it was while I was uh, eating uh, lunch. I, I did have it on my phone a bit while I was eating lunch before the the UW, the UW game, but so I didn't get to watch very much of it. Um, but uh, so I did, you know, I did watch, uh, you know, some of the highlights against Stanford um, because that we were at a we were at the Sounders game for that one. That's the one we were at the Sounders game on Thursday for. Um, uh, so we didn't get to watch all of that, but you know, uh, so I'm not going to talk specifically about these games as much as I probably could. Um, but it's just, uh, to come through, get a split on the road, uh, not, you know, hold your own against, uh, an elite team. So as to not kind of, cause that I, you got to say that that Oregon loss really hurt their resume. And if they have not done what they've done since then, uh, that might have been what knocked them out, but because of what they've done, what they've done, uh, they've proven that they can hang with top teams now. You know, by hanging with Stanford, by beating Arizona, they they've kind of put in the minds again that the, uh, of the committee that they can play with these top teams, and 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 also they fucking finished third in the conference. They're the number three seed in the Pac-12. Can you really like like that's we're at the point where they're not a bubble team. If you're the number three seed yeah. in the Pac-12, you got to be like a seven to ten seed, right? That's the part that's at the seen. very minimum. Like, like, well, and I mean, let's also be, um, let's also point this out. Like, okay, while they were the number three seed for the conference tournament, they are tied for second. Yeah, like they they literally finished second in the conference. The conference does not make any distinction between you know tiebreakers when it comes to conference standings. Yes, the uh, um, the, the twenty eighteen tiebreakers Pac- are only for the tournament. Tw- twenty eighteen Pac twelve North champions, baby. That's right. Can't take it away from us. So uh, that's yeah, right. So go ahead. So you know we finished in a tie for second place with Oregon. Now Oregon did beat us by fifty, so whatever. But um, we did. You know, we fuck that second. game. And so, that game was so weird. I know. To think about our team going eleven and six in conference, um, like honestly, as as long as I've been a Coug, um, the you know women's basketball team for the most part has been an embarrassment. Um, there's there's really just not a um, there's not a kind or gentle way to say that. Like they just have been like like not just like bad like 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 not just not good, but like objectively like horrendous. Um, and so to to come where they where they have come to under under Etheridge and you know we've talked about this before as well where um, you know last year it was it was really as far as Charlize could take them right like you know if she was good they were good and if she was bad they were bad and um, if she you know if she wasn't on they had you know really no chance of winning um, against against much of anybody to be honest it wasn't just the good teams it was, it was kind of everybody. Um, she really carried the team on her back last year. Um, she's not done that this year. I mean, she's been good this year. Like, I, I'm not trying to diminish that. But 
um, she has sort of dealt with, you know, a little bit different set of circumstances, right? She's, um, you know, been the focal point of defenses in a way that maybe she wasn't last year. They've, they've game planned for her. Um, and, and what we've, and she has struggled at times. And what we've seen is that, um, her teammates have really stepped up. Her sister's been great. Um, you know, all the, you know, the things that, you know, we were maybe kind of worried, you know, is her sister, is Crystal going to, um, you know, is she going to develop anymore? Is she going to get a little better at this or, and, and, and she's been better overall. I mean, she's still, you know, some of the things she does still make you scratch your head, but, um, in general, you know, she's a great defender. Um, you know, good, uh, good point guard. She, her shooting has ticked up, which has really kind of made a major difference, uh, for her contribution. And then you look at someone like Bella Mercatete, who was, um, the co most improved PAC 12 player of the year. That's probably the most awkward title, um, for an award ever, but, um, <laughs> they improved the was, exact same amount. I know, I, I guess. Um, but you know, Bella has made a huge, huge step forward this year. And a large part of that was, um, you know, she figured out how not to get in foul trouble every yep. game. And, um, so she became a force, uh, both defensively, which, which she already was, um, she just was having a hard time staying out of foul trouble. Um, and then also becoming a force offensively where, um, you know, I mean, there were so many times last year where she missed bunnies and we all just kind of went, Oh my God, you know, how many bunnies can she miss? Um, she's become an exceptional finisher. She just is, she's really, um, one of the best, you know, uh, front court players in the conference. And, um, so when Charlize hasn't been on her game, which has been from time to time, you know, I, I think she is, this has been, I, I won't say that she endured a, you know, a legit sophomore slump. Um, but the, the sophomore year has proven to be maybe a little more difficult for her, um, you know, than the freshman year. And even with that, um, the team is better and it's better because, you know, because Bella's gotten better because Crystal has played better, um, because we haven't even talked about, you know, Joanna Tader, um, and how much better she has been. Um, you know, and then you look at, you know, a freshman like Wallach, I mean, they just, you know, they are just, everybody is better across the board and they are more dangerous. They are more, uh, multiple in terms of how they can attack you and, and the defense is still, um, still nasty and still tough. It's and, better. Even. Um, you know, I think may, the defense is yeah, better. Yeah, it's better. And, and maybe that's why, you know, maybe that's why uh, Cammy wasn't the, you know, coach of the year. Uh, maybe, you know, I don't know how her peers uh, feel about her, but, you know, I do know that WSU is supposed to be bad and WSU is not bad. And not only are they not bad, but um, they also, you know, aren't afraid to kind of get up in your face a little bit about how not bad they are. Um, there's an edge to them and, and I can see how that would rub, you know, some people the wrong way. So, um, you know, this, this team's a fun team. They are a team to be proud of, uh, super excited for what they might do at the conference tournament. We are not going to get to really watch it. <laughs> we'll be, we'll be on our phones at the Oregon state game on Thursday, uh, trying to kind of maybe keep one eye on both games, but, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's very cool and, and they're going to make the tournament again. Um, which is, is is sort of insane to think about, and uh, I just you know I love his team. They're super fun to watch, and um, they're full of, of of great kids and great players. And um, you know they're you know as, we, as I said, I mean they're they're a team that WCU fans can be super proud of, and um, you know they they legitimately could win you know one or more games in the tournament depending on their seating. I, hopefully they'll avoid that eight nine. <laughs> I think that's kind of the big thing. Uh, you know, somehow you have to avoid being an eight, nine cause the one seeds in the women's game are so strong, but, um, you know, hopefully, yeah. hopefully that happens. Hopefully that happens. Yeah. And in, in terms of the PAC 12 tournament, they're probably going to play Utah who they lost to, but they lost to at Utah yeah. on the back end of the, the mountain trip. Utah has a lot of great shooters. Um, but you know, I, it, it seems like in the place they are now, it, it's so crazy to think when they were going in the PAC 12 tournament last year they just need to get a win and i think i think it was against was it against you a dub or something that in the in it just to just to kind of get one on the ledger so they were above 500 and 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 because they had the wins to get in the tournament they just need to not screw it up but they were so gassed like they just kind of felt like they had nothing left in the tank but i just don't feel like that this team still feels like they're playing really good ball and and totally. and they have it they have everyone and and everyone's playing better like charlie's 
has taken a step forward. She she did struggle. She did have a sophomore slump. She had a huge shooting slump in the middle of the conference season. And yep. she seems to have come out of that. And and if and she's in that position now where she can win a game for them that they should not win. With because she's kind of back in the right mindset and she's got that stroke fixed a little more. Um and and it's just uh it's to the point where you're like, yeah, we could yeah, beat Utah. Let's get Oregon again. Let's just see what happens. You know, like maybe they lose to them, but let's show that we're not 50 fucking points worse than Oregon. But I, I, I'm really excited to see what they could do against Utah. Cause, and also Utah, if they beat Utah, that's something that could potentially knock them up a seed line or two. Cause Utah is 27th in net right now. So if you can beat Utah, that's a huge win for the resume that can get you out of that eight, nine game that could even maybe get you out of that seven, 10 game. Cause really it's, you know, women's basketball has the, it's not the, the talent isn't as quite as centralized as it was maybe 10 years ago. I mean, you still have the Stanford's and, 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 and them, and now with Baylor and, uh, you know, even UConn's like a two seed this year. Uh, but even a team as talented as UConn is a two seed, but they've also had Paige Buckers has been, um, out, uh, for a considerable amount of time. But then you have teams that are like Iowa that have, one, Iowa probably has the best player in the country. Um, but, and they're going to be like a three seed. So, you know, th- there is, it's a little more, there's more, t- I mean, there's just more women's basketball talent than there ever has been. Um, and so you're, you're kind of seeing the, the fruits of all these eight, like how the AAU program and the high school programs have built like since title nine came about and, 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 and it's just, you know, since like the, the WNBA was created and, and, and all this stuff. And you're kind of seeing the fruits of that now. So yeah, it's, it, it'll be helpful to get up, you know, it, it, any improvement you can on the seed line would be helpful uh, in terms of if you want to yep. win, not just one game, but win more than one game. Um, but you know, it, and they can beat Utah if they do that. It, it's, you know, they're at 20 wins. Uh, they have another kind of top 30 type win. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I still think last year, you know, Charlie cream underestimated them and that could be potentially yep. uh, what's happening again this year. Um, yep. but yeah, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I hope we get a watch, you know, I hope they get to play one, two, three games this week. That would be great. Um, yeah, just to see something amazing happen. Uh, but, uh, I guess, you know, after all the technical difficulties and everything we've had, it, it's time to wrap up. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> if, if you send us emails, podcast versus everyone at gmail.com. Um, I'm at the Craig Powers on Twitter. Jeff is at pod versus everyone. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, Jeff, I, you know, Instagram, I just, you know, it was my daughter's first birthday. If you want to see a picture of her uh, at Craig W. Power, that's the content you come for. Uh, and, and so, uh, after all that, I'll say, after all the shit that we've gone through to record this goddamn episode, I will say, go Cougs. Go Cougs, Craig. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter.